Gentile pubblico, inizia la cerimonia, entra Martin Kemp, accompagnato dal magnifico rettore dell'Università di Studi di Urbino Carlo Bo Vilberto Stocchi e dal prorettore vicario Giorgio Calcagnini. Prende la parola il magnifico rettore Vilberto Stocchi. Buongiorno, il mio più cordiale saluto di benvenuto a quanti hanno accolto l'invito ad essere qui oggi, alle autorità civili, militari, agli studenti, ai colleghi, professori, per questo momento davvero importante, speciale, prego, saluto il Presidente del Consiglio Comunale del, di Pesaro, che ci ha raggiunto, grazie. E la presenza del Professor Martin Kemp per noi è motivo di grande gioia e un onore averlo qui. E ascolteremo il suo intervento, un esperto, un grandissimo esperto di Leonardo, una grande esperienza. Uh, I would like uh, to thank you, uh, Professor Kemp, uh, for having accepted uh, the invite to be here today with us. It's a great pleasure and honor with us. Uh, do lettura delle motivazioni del sigillo. Martin Kemp, Professor Emeritus of History of Art at the University of Oxford and Honorary Fellow at Trinity College, is an internationally renowned scholar who has had the great merit of identifying and exploring the profound connections between the history of art and the history of science from the Renaissance to the present day. He has set his lines of research on this close union in uh, an original and fruitful way, investigating the concepts of uh, visualization and imagery in these two different domains, just as science ranges from the observed complexities and of environmental biology to the unobservable dimension dimensions of theoretical physics. So, art stands from the figurative representation of nature to the elusive abstraction of conceptual art. According to this deeply innovative and original perspective, shared intuition about the natural world drive the pursuits of artists and scientists. And, uh, There are as many potential relationships as there are artists who undertake profoundly imaginative scrutiny of science and scientists who knowingly exploit their, their creative instincts in seeking what is true and beautiful. The apex of this vision is represented by Kemp's studies on Leonardo da Vinci, in which he masterfully ranged from painting to anatomy, from natural history to medicine, from geometry to optics. The inseparable link between art and science was at the center of his training in natural sciences and art history. He completed his studies first at the University of Cambridge and then at the Courtauld Institute of Art in London. Kemp then taught at prestigious universities, starting with the British Academy of Hon, and the, then became full professor for more than 25 years in Scotland at, at the University of Glasgow and St. Andrews. He has held prestigious position as visiting professor at Princeton, New York, North Carolina, Los Angeles, Montreal, and at Villa Itatti, 
of the Harvard University in Florence. The fundamental theoretical core of his research in the relationship between scientific models of nature and the theory of practice of art. This approach led him to investigate the specific fields of optics, anatomy, and natural history up to the identification of precise dynamics in common between art and science concerning certain methods of visualization, creation, and representation. The summary of his research on optics is contained in the book The Science of Art, the Optical Themes in Western Art from Brunelleschi to Siurat, Yale University Press, 1990 and 1992. In this monumental essay, he showed the unity of the visual study of nature, the exalted mutual task of Renaissance science and art. The book includes the most comprehensive account of the development of perspective theory and practice through an analysis of the major optically oriented examples of artistic theory and practice from Brunelleschi's innovation of perspective and his exploitation by Leonardo and Dury to the beginnings of photography. Starting from the award-winning book, Leonardo da Vinci, The Marvelous Works of Nature and Man, published in 1981, Kemp's contributions on Leonardo's works were fundamental. His fame as a great Leonardo scholar acquired led to entrust him in 1987 with the Ventisettesima Lettura Vinciana, the annual lecture organized by municipality of Vinci. In 1988, he edited the new edition of Sir Kenneth Clark's famous book Leonardo da Vinci, which was to be followed by Leonardo on painting, an anthology of writings by Leonardo da Vinci with a selection of documents relating to his career as an artist, Yale University Press, 1989. In the same year, Kemp is responsible for curating at the High World Gallery in London the exhibition Leonardo da Vinci, Artist, Scientist, and Inventor, whose catalog collected the authoritative contribution from the most famous Leonardo scholar of the time, including Gombrich, Roberts, and Statman. Uni Yale University Press, 1989. In the following years, Kemp has published numerous other essays and books on Leonardo and on the relationship between art and science in important magazines and with prestigious international publishing houses. In this regard, we will limit ourselves to mention only two of these contributions. His participation with an essay dedicated to Mona Lisa to Carlo Pedretti first shrift, Illuminating Leonardo, celebrating the 70 years of scholar of our Illustrium Graduate Honors Causa, edited by Constance Molfat and Sara Tagliagamba, uh, Boston, 2016. The first volume of his latest work on the new edition of the Codes Leicester, owned by Bill Gates, where, in addition to a facsimile reproduction of the folios of the precious private property code, he also offered a reconstruction of the figure of Leonardo as an, art, as an artist scientist. For these reasons, the University of Urbino Carlo Bo, heir to the humanism, that has imbued modern European civilization, bestows its highest accolade, the seal of the university, to Martin Kemp.
A magnifico oratore, signore e signori, um, è un grande onore per me ricevere il sigillo dell'Università Ubrino Carlo Bo. Il, il sigillo è stupendo, è magnifico, grazie tante, è, è, è troppo gentile. Robino è la più perfetta e suggestiva di tutte le città del Rinascimento, con consapevole che questa è la città di Federico da Montefeltro, Guidobaldo da Montefeltro, uh, la famiglia della Rovere, la città di Luciano Larana, Piero della Francesca, Francesco di Giorgio, Raffaello e Federico Borocci, è straordinario per un, un piccola città. Città. E la città dell'Intarsio Studiolo, un grande capolavoro di matematica d'arte e un ottimo simbolo degli studi nell'università moderna. Urbino è ovviamente anche la città di Muzioodi, Federico Comandino e Guidobaldo del Monte, i grandi studenti della matematica e prospettiva. La mia conferenza oggi che guarda alla prospettiva in termini dell'ottica dell'occhio e geometria astratta è dedicata a Urbino e Comandino, che è il più grato tra gli editori di geometria greca e latina. Per un città non molto grande, è, 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 è straordinario. Uh, I miei ringraziamenti in, a tutti in città sono illimitati. My lecture will be in English after, which you will now understand why. Leonardo in perspective from geometry to optics. Uh, the rector was kind enough to mention the science of art uh, published in 1990, um, translated into Italian, unsurprisingly, as La Scienza dell'arte. Uh, and this gives me a chance to revisit themes I really haven't looked at intensively for 30 years, but my next general book is looking at a cultural history of light. So this gets me back into the, into the area um, in, a, in a very remarkable and prophetic way. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm looking at two primary dimensions, which I didn't separate out very clearly in the book. They were there, but thinking about geometry outside the eye, perspective theory is very much about geometry out there. And the secondary consideration often, but not for Leonardo, about what happens in the eye and the brain. And these tend to get rather divorced in perspective theory, so I'm going to be looking at these, um, these two directions, along with the question of the instrument's uh, automated perspective, we might, uh, we, might, uh, we might call it. Uh, the middle section of the lecture, the biggest bit, is about Leonardo, but I'm going to do selected looks at Brunelleschi and some of the Quattrocento theory, and then I'm going after Leonardo to look at uh, Ignazio Dante, at Comandino briefly, and at Guidobaldo briefly. Um, so there is an, and Piero della Francesca appears, so Urbino runs through the, 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 the tapestry of this lecture. Uh, from Brunelleschi to Piero della Francesca. We know about the demonstration panel. I'm not going to discuss these in detail, but I'm looking at it in terms of the method of thinking about perspective. Um, the great Brunelleschi demonstration panel of the Battisterio in Florence, um, which I believe was done by surveying. We know that Brunelleschi had been in Rome with Donatello surveying ancient buildings. Simple measurement techniques the sort of thing you see on the front of the 16th century edition of, um, uh, uh, of Appianus's um, uh, book on, on astronomy. 
Um, these are very simple devices. They are Jacob's staff or cross staffs, and they basically measure the angle at which you see something and calculate size. And the obvious way for him to do the baptistry is to take points on the baptistry as markers, record them by surveying, and then to draw in the, the rest. It's a pragmatic, Brunelleschi, above all, is pragmatic. He's a man about experiment, about experience, and about a certain kind of pragmatism. Um, the central vanishing point, the key bit of linear perspective in many ways, is not present in this demonstration. There are two lateral points um, we don't know how wide the panel was, and we know it was set up as a peep show. That is to say, you looked through the back of the panel at the hole which is, um, which is in the uh, middle, uh, uh, at, the, at the door, and looked at a mirror image, and you could take the mirror down to see whether it looked like the baptistry. Um, so it's, it's very much a practical uh, demonstrazione of how you can record something on a flat plane. Uh, the Masaccio Trinity, uh, I think probably 13 years or so later, um, obviously creates the first perspective picture with a clear vanishing point, um, the first geometrical array of that particular kind. Um, how did he do it? My suspicion is that it was based upon a design by Brunelleschi for this chapel, this little capella uh, in, in which Christ, the God the Father stands with the crucified Christ, and that effectively it was a surveying technique using plan elevation, and the diagram on the left there is just an indication as to how you might do this, a scale drawing um, and working out the intersection points on the plane and put, filling them in and then painting in the architecture. So this can be done by Brunelleschi's method. It doesn't need geometric perspective theory. It doesn't uh, de de depend upon an independent construction. Um, then we have Alberti, who in 1435, 1436, codifies perspective. What I'm going to show you now is slightly comic. It's a little cartoon version of... Uh, of uh, Albertian perspective, which was done for a book called Arts in History, which, uh, which was basically suppressed by Amazon. They don't like enhanced e-books, and quite tyrannically they suppressed this book, which is only available in print now. So this is unusual to see what is a slightly comic, but I hope quite informative version of Alberti's system. The basic perspective construction was first explained by Leon Battista Alberti in his book On Painting in 1435. The aim was to construct a tiled floor on which figures and objects can be located. We imagine the picture as a window through which we see things. We decide the height of the horizon. We decide where our line of sight directly strikes the picture and mark it on the horizon this is later called the vanishing point. We mark out a series of regular intervals along the base of the picture, indicating the width of the tiles. Alberti's tiles were one braccio, or arm length wide, which he took as one third of the height of a man. These marks along the base are joined to the vanishing point on the horizon. We next need to work out the horizontal lines for the tiles. To do this, we look at the picture from the side with the tiles of the floor to the left, marked as points on the baseline. We locate the eye of the spectator to the right at whatever position we choose. We join the viewpoint of the eye to the points marking the tiles and note where these lines cut the vertical of the picture. These intervals are then transferred to the front view of the picture and the horizontal lines are drawn in to complete the tiled floor. All objects can then be located at any depth on the grid according to their scales in relation to the grid at that depth. Masaccio's Trinity shows the coffered vault in perspective with a vanishing point just below the platform on which the donors kneel. 
By taking Alberti's tiled floor and bending it into a semicircle, we can see how the perspective of the vault works. It and there's a diagrammatic version in case that didn't play, but it did. Um, it's intended, obviously, for a general audience, but I think it's uh, quite nice. And it reminds us it's an abstract system. The key thing that Alberti did is produce what mathematicians call the general case. You've got everything there you need for any particular bit of perspective by moving the viewpoint, by altering the scale, etc. So it produces that uh, abstract one. How does it relate to sight in Alberti? Well, Alberti begins his book with a visual pyramid, saying that we basically see by this visual pyramid, we see geometrically. Um, with the centric ray, the intermediate rays, and the peripheral or circumferential rays, but he doesn't say why that results in perspective. He goes from the pyramid into the perspective construction. The geometry is not very difficult, but he doesn't do it. So the optics are there as a statement of geometry, geometrical optics. The pictorial construction is there, but there's no obvious logical link between them in the way in which Alberti spells it out. Um, with Ghiberti, who wrote his commentaries in the 1440s, um, who came to understand the perspective construction. This is the Jacob and Esau uh, panel from the uh, Porta del Paradiso in Florence. He compiled an anthology of optical texts drawn from standard optical authorities, including Ibn al-Haytham, or al-Hazan, as he's called in the West, looking at reflection, refraction, all sorts of cases. But that stands, again, as a very separate construction, he is citing these optical texts in terms of there is some underlying rationale for perspective in the, in, in the medieval texts and the Islamic texts. But again, he doesn't really tie them in in any very direct way. So the, the optical construction and the geometrical con construction remain um, in contact but not really integrated. Um, with the great perspectivists of the next gener of the younger generation, Uccello and, uh, and Piero della Francesca, it's mathematics that rules. The delight is less in how the eye works, but more in the geometry of space, these constructed figures. I'm exemplified, obviously, by the flood in Florence in Santa Maria Novella, and the extraordinary Mazzocchio, the headband, which has fallen down around the neck of this protagonist. And the Mazzocchio becomes a symbol in a way of perspective. If you're good at perspective, you're expected to do a Mazzocchio, geometric figures, lutes. There were certain set piece things that you were meant to do as a perspectivist. Um, drawings attributed to Uccello, we don't know whether they're by him, they could be by one of the Intarsia designers, but clearly Uccello made drawings of this sort. Um, in 1992, I did an exhibition, or I was curate, part curator of an exhibition in Washington. We did a film called Masters of Illusion, and we worked with Hollywood special effect filmmakers to look at Renaissance illusion. And I showed them the drawing of the chalice on the right, and uh, I said, they said, who's that by and when was it made? I said, that's about 1440 Uccello. And they said, no, when was it made? And they couldn't believe that wireframe was done in 1440. Um, obviously, Piero della Francesca, now if you read De Prospectiva Pingendi, um, the great citations there are Euclid. They're not medieval optical texts. There are not texts about how you see. Piero takes it that vision is a geometric form and then uses that for an extraordinary complicated geometry in the pictures and the flagellation, obviously. Um, what I showed in the science of art is that the patterns of the floor, the complicated tile pattern, and of course the, the circular pattern, foreshortened absolutely meticulously down to the last millimeter, that these are based upon incommensurable ratios. They're based upon the square root of two. The tiles outside the, uh, the praetorium, the area sanctified by Christ's flagellation, uh, they're ar arithmetical divisions. So he's used a deliberate contrast between simple one, two, three, four arithmetic and incommensurable irrational ratios. Um, 
The technique for doing this almost certainly was the, the foreshortened plane, and he's able to locate, as I show in my diagram on the right, any given point can be located in the foreshortened plane. I won't go into that technically. If you want to follow the geometry, the, La Scienza dell'Arte will explain what's going on. Uh, the other technique was the plan and elevation technique, which is related to what I'm assuming that uh, Masaccio did with, um, with Brunelleschi for the Trinity. The Mazzocchio on the right foreshortened. On the left is my transcription of the plan. You need the elevation and the plan of the Mazzocchio and plots the, the points I've just picked up. Uh, one of the points to show how it projects on the plane. You produce all these on the foreshortened plane, you join up the dots and you have your, your wireframe that's off you. Um, obvious Urbino in instances. The best slide I could find, I'm sorry, was a Getty Images one, but uh, it'll make the point. And this makes the point about the cultural setting for the geometry of perspective. It's in with astronomy and music and precise sciences. Uh, Leonardo calls music la figurazione delle cose invisibile. Um, so music is fundamentally a harmonic system, as is the system of geometry. And this really exemplifies this also with the astrolabe and the, and the uh, armillary sphere, um, emphasizing that it's to do with celestial measurement. So this is a statement, it's Euclid, it's uh, Renaissance cosmology, it's Renaissance harmonics, it's geometry. It's not primarily matters of perception and how we see. Um, Piero obviously does it with the human head as well, um, projecting all these points meticulously. Um, did he use that? I think it's highly likely. Uh, when he shows Christ frontally in the resurrection, all the lesser figures are foreshortened. It's a decorum as well as, a, uh, as, well as an optical system. Um, Christ is unforeshortened. He doesn't obey the rules. Um, the soldiers, on the other hand, do. And I think it also simplifies forms, doesn't it? That if you do this dot by dot technique, you end up with a synthesis of form rather than very uh, direct organic form. Um, does he do this? Well, if we look at the foot in the adoration in the resurrection, yes, he did. This, he is absolutely manic about precision. Here we've got Christ's foot done from a cartoon, all pricked round, absolutely extraordinary. In the flagellation, the, the turban of the chief flagellator is done from a cartoon, and it's about as big as my, big as my fingernail. Now, Piero like Leonardo is a bit of a lunatic. He has to get things right. It's not very practical. He's a slow painter like Leonardo. These people had to get things right. It's a moral imperative. Then Leonardo, um, what I'm calling the optical turn, uh, a very noted turn from geometry to optics of the eye, how the eye works. Um, he begins from an Albertian standpoint. This is my transcription on the right of one of Leonardo's basic perspective diagrams. It basically condenses the Albertian system on the left into a single diagram. It's exactly the same method, but just uh, overlaid in a way which he expects you to understand. Um, he is committed like Alberti very early on, and he knows Alberti's writing certainly to the visual pyramid. Um, this is, doesn't really deal with how the eye sees. It simply says, we see by a pyramid. The text is taken from a medieval optical text by John Peckham, Perspectiva Communis, and it's the preface to Peckham's book, uh, 14th century uh, Franciscan English philosopher and student of optics, and it talks in that preface about the wonders and glories of light as a metaphor for God. So this is very much the, the location of... Um, of Leonardo's early studies, the, the wonders of geometry and nature, but nature out there, not the geometry of the eye per se. Um, again, straight from Peckham, a series of uh, visual pyramids, visual triangles, he explains that we see via pyramids, and if you locate the eye around the points of that, of that figure, then you will see the circle as the same size as you come away, so it's seen under narrower angles. Again, this is a justification for diminution in perspective, but doesn't tell you about the perspective construction. Uh, for Leonardo, this pyramid is fundamental. 
It's the pyramid of all things, optics, gravity in reverse. It shows the diminution of force. Force diminishes pyramidally. Uh, this is from the uh, Codex Arundel, and he explains it's a kind of universal rule as to the behavior of the powers of nature. They behave pyramidally, either in reverse or normally tapering off as their power disperses. So this is not simply an optical technique, it's a profound philosophical principle between the, the physics of everything in nature. Um, all well and good, we can go into the adoration and we see uh, a meticulous perspective drawing for, uh, uh, for the backgrounds in the adoration, absolutely incredibly detailed. Along there, it's divided into tenths. It's already absolutely compressed as it goes back, but there is this insistence, like Piero della Francesca, in getting it right. Okay, excellent. I'm not getting it for some reason. Oh, it's that one. Right. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, the <laughs> thank you. Uh, that's that's the tile that's divided into uh, into ten into ten divisions. He doesn't use that, but um, you can see the kind of precision he's aiming at. However, at the time of the adoration, he's already worried about uh, linear perspective and its its problems. Um, this very scrappy drawing is almost certainly for the tiled floor of the. But here he's looking at the eye a picture plane and three columns and he notes that the distance between the columns should get shorter. So if you're doing th three columns in perspective from a close viewpoint, the columns should get effectively fatter as they get away and the distances between them get narrower. So he, already at the time of the adoration he's saying optically, perceptually, it's not as simple as um, Alberti has, has suggested. By the time he's working on the second version of the Virgin of the Rocks in 1494, he's even more worried about what happens at close viewpoints. He's looking at the Virgin close up, and I think it then triggers this diagram, which says what happens if we look at something perspectively very, very close up. Um, this is the eye, this is the plane, these are the intervals, and you end up with this absurd position that that interval there, the actual tile itself, is shorter than the projection. Um, and he suggests that maybe a curvilinear picture plane would work better. Um, so he's very, very concerned about the inconsistencies of perspective, and this is my transcription of one of his diagrams. He's thinking about doing a circular picture plane, or saying, is this not more accurate? In fact, he doesn't do that in painting. He carries on, as we might expect, with orthodox perspective. But what he does is to separate these out between uh, prospettiva naturale, how the eye actually sees, and prospettiva artificiale. So he makes a clear separation between the functioning geometry of perspective, like Alberti, like Piero, and the actual act of seeing. And this is very fundamental. It's taken up in the 17th century, but is uh, almost a unique concern in the Renaissance. Yeah, the basic perspective scheme is fairly simple, though he isolates it. You can't tell how high the coffers go. They go up at some distance. You can't tell the junction between the lateral edges of the wall because he blurs it. It's not a pilaster, it's just a space. So he's trying to reduce the vulnerability of perspective, but the basic construction remains artificial perspective, uh, prospettiva artificiale. At this time, he's much concerned with harmonic series of numbers. Um, we'll look at his relationship shortly with, uh, with Luca Pacioli, but this is happening in the Last Supper drawings. Um, we've got the construction of an octagon from a straight edge and compass, and we've got a series of numbers here which are certainly not additions or multiplications, but are thinking about harmonic series of numbers. And the tapestries in the Last Supper recede one to a half to a third to a quarter, a Pythagorean series. And if you 
put, if you deprojected these, if you flatten them out, they would actually get wider as they go back. So he's deliberately contriving what we might call a visual music. And this is the period in 1496 when he's illustrating Luca Pacioli's De Divina Proportione on divine proportion, looking at the five regular solids, at their various forms in uh, truncation and stellation, cutting off the corners and building up prisms or pyramids on their, on their faces. This is a, a dodecahedron which has been uh, truncated into an icosi dodecahedron. On the left, by comparison, I've put uh, Piero della Francesca's uh, book on the five regular solids. Leonardo gives the solids reality. Leonardo is absolutely amazing when he can give something solid reality. He's not much good at the, at the literal flat geometry. He's got almost no algebra and he's pretty bad at arithmetic. But once he can get geometry into a plastic thing, then he's... He's really in business. Then you can see what this brilliant technique, solid and fenestrated, opened up with these windows, how much more readily we can read that than the De Cinque Corporibus Regularibus of, um, of Piero della Francesca. Of course, De Prospectiva Pingendi and De Corpus uh, Regularibus are both in the Montefeltro Library presented by Piero himself. And published in 1509 in Florence, the only Leonardo's that were, were published. Um, this is an elaborate stellated version. Uh, wondrous ge geometry, which became symbols of uh, Euclidean and uh, uh, Pythagorean geometry in, in, in the Renaissance. So in the 1490s, Leonardo is doing very much a Piero della Francesca thing. It's abstract geometry. It's the aesthetics of harmony. It's the, the music of, uh, of forms in space. Um, about this time, he's doing even more elaborate things with Mazzocchi than even Piero della Francesca and, uh, uh, and Uccello did. This is a drawing which has been folded over. He's done half the drawing geometrically. He folds it over, pricks it through, and then fills in the, the other side of it. Um, Another extraordinary, extraordinary variant, looking like a mill wheel, but I think it's actually simply an abstract. It's a fantasia on these uh, Mazzocchio themes. And perhaps the most fascinating of all, um, this idea, as far as we know, not realized, but maybe realized, uh, for a, corpo, uh, a body born of the perspective of Leonardo da Vinci, disciple of experience. Um, this, this, this body will be made without solidity, without corpo, but only with, with, with lines alone, simple lines. Um, so he's, in a sense, saying that he can go beyond Piero della Francesca, he can go beyond, but he's calling himself a disciple di, di esperienza, of experience, um, which is almost a liet motif for Leonardo's ideas. So he's seeing this as, as a matter of experience. What then happens with Leonardo after 1500, he becomes aware of medieval optics in a much more profound way, above all Ibn al-Haytham, al-Hazan. And it's absolutely clear that he knew the text. Ghiberti knew an Italian version of uh, Ibn al-Haytham's text, at least in part. And Leonardo clearly has knowledge of it. Um, and the optics of Ibn al-Haytham, like the medieval Western philosophers is about refraction, reflection, direct light. Um, and perspective is, is not readily extractable from it. We find Leonardo after 1500 paying a lot of attention to concave mirrors on the right there in the Codex Arundel and trying to work out the problem of focus of a mirror which is, uh, which is a section of a sphere. Um, and, and knowing that that won't produce a sharp focus. So he's working his way towards a parabolic um, focus. On the left is the problem of Alhazen. Uh, this is how do you determine the, where the eye sees a highlight on a round polished ball. It's a, it's a non-trivial problem. It basically requires trigonometry. But what Leonardo did was devise or try to devise a mechanical means. So this is a little mechanical device for trying to get the, uh, the, the focal point. It's called the problem of Al Alhazen, the problem of Ibn Al-Haytham. And Leonardo clearly knew this geometry. 
What Ibn al-Haytham and his knowledge of Islamic optics did was to produce a very complicated picture of the eye. No longer the straight pyramid. The pyramid goes through the pupil, it's inverted. The crystalline humor, what we would call the lens, reinverts it, and it's received on a surface at the back of the eye. Um, these, I won't go into these in any detail, but you can see how complicated the internal optics of the eye has become in the light of Ibn al-Haytham's uh, work. The, the, di the, the diagram in the... This diagram here, I'll be picking up a, a very, very shortly. Uh, these are my transcriptions of his drawings taking off from Ibn al-Haytham and this idea of a, of a receptive surface. At the top, he says, if it's something very thin, close to the eye, it's blurred. If you're looking at an edge at a decent distance away from the eye, you've got a sharp image in the middle, but lots of surrounding images in relation to the background. And he says, the eye does not know the edge of any body. Mona Lisa, there are no edges. Salvatore Mundi, there are no edges. Uh, John the Baptist, there are no edges. The eye does not know the edge of any body. And at the bottom is this wonderful experiment in which he thinks he's drawn a line across the visual receptive area. And what you're taking there um, is you've got a, a pinhole plane. This has got a small hole in it. You've got the receptive area in the eye. This is schematic. It's not drawn to look like an eye. And you take a needle or a very thin object and you pass it up and down here, you actually see the image of the needle go moving in the opposite direction. Um, and this is Ibn al-Haytham. Nobody else, as far as I know, has got this at all, but Leonardo picks it up. And it's pretty cast-iron proof that he was looking at uh, Islamic optics. And they produce what I call the optics of uncertainty. The Albertian optics is optics of certainty. Leonardo produces the optics of uncertainty, that sight becomes a complicated and slippery thing. Uh, Al Ibn al-Haytham deals with extreme things that we don't see, like too fast, too dark, too big, too small. Uh, he deals with decepcionis visus in Latin, visual deceptions. One of the things he looks at is the way in which the spokes in a wheel are blurred if it whirls round, and Leonardo discusses that. He also says if you look at the string of a lute, you can't see it when it's, when it's vibrating. When you look at a knife put in the table and twang it, it goes... Doo -doo -doo -doo, and it's too quick, you can't see it. And he won't paint it. He says these are for the speculatori, they're not for the pittori. They're not for the painters of pictures, they're for the philosophers. Um, but just my footnote, which I... Uh, which you saw slightly prematurely, of course, Velasquez in the 17th century does this. Miraculous bit of perceptual painting, he produces blur. Leonardo wouldn't do that, it's pictorial bad manners, and it would be incomprehensible to the viewer. Um, and perhaps with one of the nicest elements of it, and this relates to our new edition of the Codex Lester, the, the, the manuscript owned by Bill Gates, the ashen light, the Lumen Cenereum on the moon, um, looking at the relationship between the sun, the moon, which he sees as having seas on it, i.e. it's very reflective like the earth, and light on the earth. And this with the new moon is essentially earth light on the moon, um, with the crescent moon very bright. Now Galileo later discusses this, but what Galileo didn't discuss was the subjective effect. Leonardo says that down here it looks much darker, the ashen light on the moon, looks much darker because it's against the bright, pit, the bright heart, uh, sickle of the moon. And up here, against the blackness of the void, it looks lighter. Um, very remarkable. Um, subjective effects. And he's saying the eye cannot even be trusted to see whether something's light or dark. He knows that red, green, blue, yellow, black, white produce enhanced contrast. It isn't a single, uh, just given, given level. And we look, at the, we look at these pictures, Salvatore Mundi, which I think is undoubtedly by Leonardo, not least for this reason, uh, St. John the Baptist, and look at them in detail. The eye does not know the edge of any body. This is the optics of uncertainty. It's also the optics of ineffability in terms of theology. It's also the optics of psychology that we 
add our own meanings to something which is left indefinite. An extraordinary combination of, of science, of perception, of psychology, and, and theology. And only Leonardo could do that. Uh, quick, just a quick run through machines and the automation of perspective. Um, Leonardo himself did a, a perspective machine, a rather simple, um, simple window for it. Uh, this is myself in the Museo Ideali in Vinci, Alessandro Vezzosi's establishment, uh, trying out his reconstruction of the of the drawing in the Cogit Atlantico. It's, it's not an early drawing, this, the shading and setup of this drawing. It's about 1508 or maybe even later, but it's about the time when he's writing on the eye. The manuscript on the eye, manuscript E in Paris, is about 1507-1508. Uh, the great master of the perspective machines, uh, Dürer's Unterweisung der Messung, um, tra translated into, into Latin by Camerarius, um, showing these various perspective devices. You absolutely wouldn't put a model as close to the, uh, the veil or the grid as that. These are demonstrazioni in Italian. They're not saying this is how you do perspective paintings. The instruments are a certification of perspective rather, I think, than pictorial aids that you were expected to get these out when you, paint, when you, you, you designed a picture. Um, with Wenzel Jamnitzer, the great, uh, we're going to see some geometric solids by Jamnitzer, the, the great Nuremberg goldsmith, here with his sighting device, his own perspective machine, registering the points across the picture plane, which can then be joined up. Um, Vignola from the Le Due Regole, the book edited and commented on by Ignazio Dante. Again, a great big perspective machine. It's a demonstrazione, I think, not a practical device. Um, these, are, these are rhetorical machines. Um, they're collector's machines. They're the sort of thing that a princely cabinet might have. Um, and Ludovico Cigoli in 16, about 1600, a very interesting automated device done by pulleys. And as you move your hand, the left hand pulls, the right hand moves the instrument around, the, the bead moves across, the vertical moves across. It's a completely automated system for drawing geometric solids or bodies or whatever. Um, and just a, a rather late footnote, this is Christoph Scheiner, Galileo's sparring partner in relation to the moon. Um, and he invents a pantograph for enlarging and, re, uh, and reducing the size of images, and he can use it for perspective. But what we find in the 16th century is that geometry, the kind of Pira della Francesca, Fantasie, these elaborate geometric solids uh, begin, begin to come out. This is Laurence Sturr, um, a great surreal compilation of, uh, of geometric solids. Um, Hans Lenker, um, Prospettiva liter Perspectiva Literaria, Literary Perspective, foreshortening letters and other forms, including one that works variations on the geometry of nature, on the geometry of a terminated, uh, terminated shell. And Wenzel Jamnitzer, very extraordinary, a great goldsmith, great life caster, uh, cast natural things from life. And here he is working this extraordinary visual music of perspective, quite detached, I think, from per pictorial perspective in any practical way. It's an aesthetic. It's an aesthetic of the magic of perspective and its beguiling geometric harmonies. And I've used the term music a number of times, and I think it is appropriate. This is kind of polyphonic geometry. And I've just, I'm just cataloguing a series of books for a Christie's sale of the Vroom collection of perspective. And this curious thing is in the collection, a drawing. Um, FB signed Filippo Brunelleschi, no. Um, but it's an example of the fantasie which were done. Now I wonder whether this is Filippo Bal Baldinucci, who was a draftsman himself, uh, the authority on visual arts in mid 16th century Florence. And the geometry is not very good, but it's a kind of, it's a homage to that kind of thing. Um, and finally, the geometry of projection, which brings us into the, the last phase of the talk. 
uh, beginning with Ignazio Dante, or rather Giacomo Vignola, the great architect, his book on the two rules of perspective. The rules are the one using the intersection method and using a diagonal through a square. Again, if you want to check up on the geometry of that, uh, look at La Scienza dell'arte. De um, Vignola, an architect, a uh, very distinguished architect, a master of il visual illusions, and Ignazio Dante, a scientist, an astronomer, very important in the reform of the calendar eventually in Rome under the Bolognese Pope. Um, and the, the book shows the harmony between the two rules. On the left is the rule which deals with the, di the diagonals of the square um, and calculating the, the position of the vanishing points. And on the right, the intersection method and he's contrived a setup so that basically the intersection method, the picture plane and the diagonal plane, uh, result in the same thing. And he says it's, they're just different techniques. The geometry is essentially the same, which is, of course, right. Um, quite complicated constructions of vanishing points for objects at different angles. Um, and interestingly, Ignacio Dante introduces the matter of the eye. This is one of the earliest illustrations which shows a lenticular, a lens-shaped lens, rather than the spherical one which had prevailed up to that point. He talks about binocular vision, he talks about viewing angle. So Ignacio Dante, it reintroduces the eye as a commentary on Vignola's perspective, which is about geometry out there and not about the, the eye at all. Uh, very important uh, move in projective geometry. What Comandino does is to put, take perspective geometry in, or transform it into projective geometry so it becomes a discipline in its own right. This is probably the greatest of all editors of Latin and Greek texts. Uh, it, here we've got the, the planisferium, the planisphere of Ptolemy, and we've got Apollonius on conics. What Comandino shows is that conics is a form of perspectival projection or vice versa. If you're projecting a circle in perspective, artist's perspective, basically you're dealing with conic sections. Um, I've got this in two diagrams I've pillaged from the internet. Um, we could think of the one on the left, the picture plane, as being skewed. And then this explains how a circle becomes transformed into an ellipse. Um, which you can obviously as part of painter's perspective. Here it's a skewed, uh, a, a skewed cone, and you could section this at any angle. You could imagine a picture plane through here, perhaps a vertical plane, which would produce the e ellipse of a foreshortened square. So this is a union between Apollonius, difficult book, Apollonius's Conics, complicated in places rather incomprehensible, but he's got Apollonius's conics as a form of perspectival geometry and vice versa. Um, his two perspective constructions, again, I won't go through these in any detail, but these are remarkably abstract geometrical constructions. This is projective geometry by Comandino. Um, you wouldn't give this to an artist and say this tells you how to do perspective. It's developing into a geometric science in its own right. Um, and Guido Baldo, uh, Guido Baldo del Monte, 1600, his Perspectiva in six books, Libri Sex, is um, 1600 marks our, our finishing point, and it's a very notable finishing point. Um, very, again, very complicated project, uh, projective geometry, not the sort of thing you would expect a, a painter to immediately understand, and not to, it's not seen in pictorial terms, and the book's laid out like a book of mathematics. It's not laid out like a book of instructional geometry for painters. It's absolutely a different kind of thing. Uh, a, a sphere, uh, a, a circle on a tilted plane, the sort of Comandino kind of thing. And uh, not least, Guido Baldo formulates the, uh, the theorem for a vanishing point for any given line. He's saying here, if we've got this line BA, which hits the picture plane here, We've got an observer here, that will be the vanishing point at that, there. So he can do it for any given line, any given direction. Here you've got two lines, B, A, D, C, and they, they share the vanishing point for an observer. And 
I've redrawn this in a way which I don't think clarifies it, but uh, uh, at least demonstrates how it works. You've got the eye here from a spectator. You've got a picture, a horizontal, a horizon line in the intersection here. Um, you've got two lines at that angle to the uh, to the, pic the base of the picture plane. You draw your parallel across here, parallel to that. You go up, and that's the vanishing point for all these lines. Um, again, it's the sort of thing you don't necessarily expect painters to worry about. But interestingly, Galileo's friend, Ludovico Cigli, did. He's about the only artist I know who was interested in this basic notion of the vanishing point for any given line. This is his... Uh, uh, manuscript book on perspective, not published until relatively recently, but the spectator here is faced with this array of parallel lines and a series of vanishing points. And of course, uh, Chigoli is rather exceptional, a friend of Galileo in Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome when he showed the, Virgin, the ascent of the Virgin. He shows the Virgin standing on a Galilean moon uh, as in Sidereus Nuncius, the, the pitted and pockmarked moon with craters, which was Galileo's signal and one of his most uh, heretical ob observations. So Chigal is, a, is, is, um, is an exception. So to sum up, what we've seen in this lecture is an optical trend, which on the whole then only, is only fully expressed through Leonardo and to some extent Ignazio Dante. We see the geometry out there, um, and it's a, um, we see the translation of the painter's perspective with Comandino and Guidobaldo into pure geometry, into a branch of geometry in its own right, projective geometry. It's a complicated story. I've raced through it, but I hope it's given you some idea of these uh, balancing, uh, balancing aspects and how remarkable Leonardo is. He's the only one who really says, the eye deceives us a lot. The rest of them are saying, the eye does remarkably geometric things. Thank you. Signore e signori, a così termine la cerimonia. Vi ringraziamo di aver partecipato. Grazie.